All right. Welcome, everybody, for Introduced and Extirpated Mammals of Maryland. We're so happy to have our very own Natural History Society of Maryland Curator of Mammalogy with us, Steve Sheffield. He's also a professor at Bowie State. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Steve. Thank you so much, Steve, for being with us and sharing your knowledge. We can't wait to learn from you. Thanks, Bronwyn. It's really nice to be here. It's great to have everybody here. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's see. I want to move on here. So, all right. So, so the talk tonight is talking about extirpated and introduced mammals of Maryland. So this is not an exhaustive list of extirpated animals, and it's not an exhaustive list of introduced mammals. So these are, these are species that I chose that are highlights, okay? So I wanna highlight these species, okay? So before I do that, first what I wanna do is I want to just do a quick checklist of what we have in the state as far as mammals go. Okay, so in the class mammalia in Maryland, we have, according to my count, 10 orders of mammals. We have 31 families of mammals. We have 74 genera of mammals, and we have 108 species of mammals. Okay, the, um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the Maryland uh, Biodiversity Project. I, I imagine some of you are. Um, that has 106 species listed. Um, and the reason that our totals are different is because they don't count the red wolf and they don't count the Mexican free-tailed bat, which is a new arrival to the state. Okay, so that's, the, that's why there's a discrepancy there. Um, the authority on the mammals of Maryland is the Paradiso uh, publication, 1969. So you can see that that is more than 50 years out of date. Okay, so that, that's the recognized authority on the mammals of the state of Maryland. Um, I have for several years now been working on an update to that book. Okay, so I expect that at some point I will be able to update that. Um, so it's, it's in the works, it's just, uh, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work, so it's not, it's not done yet. Um, so which animals, which mammals are we looking at tonight. So here's my list that I'm highlighting. So I have the American bison, American Steve, elk. Are, are you sharing your screen yet? All right. Where I don't see I don't see a place where it says share my screen. Oh, just like we did. The, yep. Yeah, when we were testing it out. How's that? Is that working? If there's a little bit of a time lag, um, I'm sure that it'll, did you, did you share it and then, and then choose that? Um... No, I guess that didn't work. Let me go back. All right, so, all right, stop video, exit. Hmm, Just are my like slides not sharing? No, just like we did earlier on. So you do this, the share screen and then it pops up all of the, the open um, windows that you have and you select the presentation window and then hit share again. All right, well, I didn't see that this time. So let me, let me go back. So I guess I need to, do I need to minimize the, the slides? No, it should be at the bottom. If you look at the bottom of your screen, it should say, say share screen. Is it saying that? Uh, no, it's not. Okay. All right, let's see here. Nope. Bear with us, bear with us folks. Yeah. Bear with us everybody, we'll get this fixed here in a second. We had it all rocking and rolling. No, I have my PowerPoints up and I could see your video feed on the side and minimize, but I, I don't see any share here. Well, get out of your PowerPoint. Okay. Because that's, you're, you're not, you're not there sharing. We go. Okay, put, minimize that. 
All right, now go back to the other screen in the, is everybody big or in the Brady Bunch view? No, I'm not getting that. I'm getting you minimized and that's all I'm getting. Oh, okay. In the corner of me is, do you see a, a little green um, arrow that kind of is facing? Yep. Okay, hit that. There That'll, we go. All right. So now I got, now I'm back here. Okay. Okay, so. Share screen then. Share screen. There it is right there. Okay, and then pick this. There, there we go. There we go. All right. We're fixed. Sorry about that. That's okay. And then you want to do slideshow and go ahead and start the slideshow. Slideshow. Yep. And then play from the beginning. There you go. There we go. All right. We're cooking with butter now. Okay. All right. So um, what I was saying is a, a quick checklist of the mammals of Maryland. We have the class mammalia. We've got 10 different orders of mammals, 31 different families, 74 different genera, and 108 species of mammals in Maryland. Okay, and that does include the marine mammals. Okay, so we do have recognized marine mammals that do occur in Maryland water, so that counts. And as I was saying, the Maryland Biodiversity Project only lists 106 species of mammals because they don't include the red wolf, and they don't include, include the Mexican free-tailed bat, which has recently moved from the south into Maryland. Okay, and so the, the authority for mammals of Maryland goes back 50 plus years, which is the Paradiso publication in 1969, Mammals of Maryland. And I have been working on an update of that for several years now. And I can tell you it's a huge amount of work and it's not done yet. So um, hopefully it will be done in the near future. So my, here's my selected list that I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, each one briefly, um, American bison, American elk, mountain lion, American marten, gray wolf, red wolf, and snowshoe hare. So each of these species used to occur in Maryland. They no longer occur here. Um, these mammals have been extirpated since European colonization, okay? So there's other mammals that have been extirpated previous to that. So I'm not getting into that. So I'm really doing, I'm really dealing with the ones that are extirpated since the Europeans colonized North America, okay? So those are the ones I'm concentrating on here, okay? So the first one here, and I just absolutely love this photo, of a bison facing off with a black-tailed prairie dog. Okay, obviously we don't have prairie dogs here. This is a picture that came from the Midwest, from Oklahoma, um, which is where I used to live and went to school. Uh, so here's a, a map showing the former range of bison in, in North America. So you could see that they extended pretty far across the continent. Um, and so you could see over here on the right-hand side, you could see, whoop, 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 let me go back. You could see that they lasted um, into the late 1700s in some places here. Some, some, some lasted to the 1800s, uh, but you could see how much they've been um, decimated from their original uh, population levels which were estimated anywhere from 30 to 60 million animals. Okay, um, so they were extirpated from Maryland probably by 1775. So right around the birth, the time of the birth of this country. Um, the last records were from Garrett County. Um, they used to occur in the Western County. So probably the, the, the Western foremost counties. So Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, and possibly Frederick. Um, they preferred grassy open areas. Um, these are the Eastern Plains bison. Um, they weren't officially declared extinct until 1940. So they waited a long time before um, declaring them extinct. Why were they wiped out? And, and I, should, I should clarify for people that are not familiar with the term, extirpation doesn't necessarily mean extinction. Extirpation means you're taking, you're removing 
a species from a given area, there can still be that same species in other areas. Okay, so we're saying that they were basically wiped out from Maryland. So the term that you would use is extirpated, not extinct. Okay, because they occur in other places. Okay, so, um, so why were bison extirpated? Unregulated and just incredible overhunting. So people just, there was no laws, no rules for most of the time. And so they just got hunted till they disappeared. Um, right today, there's about 30,000 bison that are found on public lands in the US. And as I mentioned, the historic estimates were 30 to 60 million. Um, and the Eastern Plains bison were slightly smaller than the Great Plains bison. Uh, so the ones that we had in Maryland were smaller than the ones you see in the Great Plains. And also the Eastern bison that was in Maryland had a distinct hump in the middle of its back. So it had a, a slightly different physical appearance than the, the bison that are in the Great Plains. And we go to the elk, uh, an amazing animal. Um, and it was wiped out from Maryland, extirpated pre-1850. Okay, so the last records I could find were in the 1840s. Um, the range was statewide. Um, the last eastern elk in the whole eastern U.S. was killed in Pennsylvania in 1877. So they were wiped out pretty fast. Um, why were they extirpated? Again, unregulated and overhunting, as well as loss of habitat. Um, how do we know the elk occurred across the state? If you think about it, a lot of you are familiar with the different names of towns and counties and, and rivers and things throughout the state. Think about all the different places that you know that have the word elk in them. There, I, I counted up, there was a list of about 15 or 20 different places throughout Maryland that have the word elk in them. So like Elkton and, and all of those different places, that that's a record of elk being there, okay? And so they did occur across the state. Their preferred habitat was generally early successional habitats, which means um, where, the, where the plants are, are, are not, um, you don't have uh, forest, big trees and forests, you have more grassy, shrubby areas. Um, so they like meadows, they like shrublands and young forests. Um, elk have been reintroduced recently into Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia, Michigan, Kentucky, Tennessee, Wisconsin, and Arkansas. The largest effort so far has been in Eastern Kentucky where they have about 10,000 animals right now. Uh, Maryland had an option to be able to reintroduce elk and they actually um, decided not to do it. They rejected the idea because local people in the area objected to that plan. Um, the closest elk herd that if you wanted to go see elk, like right now, you could go up to a place called Benazet, Pennsylvania, which happens to be, not surprisingly, in Elk County, Pennsylvania. Um, that's a couple hours drive, and there's about 1,400 animals up there. Um, and one of the things about elk is that they are big dollars. So uh, a recent auction up in Pennsylvania for an elk hunting tag got $85,000 just for one tag. So elk hunting is a very, very big market. Um, and so um, it's too bad Maryland doesn't have them anymore, but uh, you don't have to go too far to see some if you want to. Um, Benazette, by the way, Elk County is up uh, in South, I mean, North Central Pennsylvania. Um, now we get to the mountain lion. Okay, so the mountain lion is also known as puma, cougar, panther, catamount. There's several different um, alternate names to it. It was probably wiped out in Maryland by the mid to late 1800s. Why was it extirpated? Extreme human persecution. Uh, people would see them and just shoot them. Um, predator control, loss of habitat. Um, so those are things that chase them out. Um, also over harvesting of prey. Um, they focus on large prey, and so if you wipe the elk and the deer out, you're going to you're going to um, the, the mountain lions will follow that, okay? And so 
people people may not realize that we actually extirpated white-tailed deer at one point also. Okay, so there were no deer left in Maryland by the 20s and 30s. We actually had to go to Michigan and Wisconsin and bring in deer from those areas to repopulate Maryland. So we, we did a number on the large ungulate um, populations in the state. Uh, the closest population for mountain lion is the Florida panther, and those occur down in the Everglades, and that's a, that's a different subspecies of mountain lion. Um, the eastern cougar, which is what, what occurred in Maryland, was formally declared extinct in 2018, so only two years ago. And what, what I find ironic is, is that they declared it extinct even before it was ever protected. So they never protected it. All of a sudden, they just declared it extinct. And when you declare something extinct, that means it removes responsibility from you to try to protect it, which is unfortunate. Um, their preferred habitat, they're pretty much generalist as far as habitat goes. They like lowland and montane forest. They like grasslands. They like brush. They like swamps. Basically, any place where they can find their prey, that's going to be their habitat. Their prey is generally white-tailed deer, used to be elk, uh, squirrels, rabbits and hares, muskrats, any, any kind of small to medium mammal. Also birds and livestock and also carrion, carrion being dead animals. So they will feed on dead animals. And one of the things that's really interesting about mountain lions is that when they make a kill, they're going to actually um, move it away from the site and they're going to bury it. They'll cover it up. And so they'll come back to it more than one time to feed on it. So if it's a white-tailed deer, like an adult white-tailed deer, they'll drag it and cover it with branches and stuff like that to try to hide it. And then they'll come back to it multiple times to feed on it. Um, and, and that supports a huge population or community actually of insects and other bugs that would be colonizing the carcass. And so I actually know people that are studying that. It's fascinating with all the different beetles and other things they find in carcasses from mountain lions. Um, lots of sightings reported around of mountain lions around the eastern U.S. Um, most all of them are, are, are with no evidence or not, um, not backed up well enough to even consider them uh, realistic. Um, so people do report that they do get around or that they see them in various places, but most of them are not, not viable um, sightings. Um, what, the one mention I would make um, is that in 2011, there was a mountain lion that was killed by a car in Connecticut. And they actually checked to make sure where that animal came from because people were thinking that it was a release of a pet or something, a pet escape. It turns out that they did a DNA analysis on it and they found out that it actually was born in the Black Hills of South Dakota and it moved 15, more, more than 1,500 miles to Connecticut. So they can get around. They can move hundreds of miles at a time. And so that's one of the reasons why they're so hard to get viewings of or sightings. Okay. Um, American Martin is next. And this is a really cool animal. It's in the family Mustelidae, so it's a weasel. Okay. And these guys were probably extirpated in Maryland by the early 1800s. Why were they extirpated? Unregulated and over-trapping, for one, because they have a very nice pelage on them that people value. Also, loss of habitat. So along with all the logging, went the American martin, okay, as well as its, its close relative, the fisher, which we'll talk about shortly. The closest population of martins right now to Maryland is in the Adirondacks of New York which is up in the, the north central part of the state. Um, some states have been attempting to reintroduce martins, like Wisconsin, but um, one of the problems that they ran into that they didn't realize or they didn't um, expect was that they're also reintroducing fishers. And the fisher is a larger relative of the martin. And what happened is the fishers were killing the martins. And so they were wondering why their martin reintroduction wasn't going so well and then they realized that the fishers were killing them. 
So you have to, if you're going to reintroduce martens, you kind of have to do it without the fissures. Uh, preferred habitat for martens, generally coniferous forest or mixed coniferous deciduous forest with large trees for denning. So they require some large hollow trees. Their prey is normally small mammals. They like squirrels. They eat birds and bird eggs. They also will eat carrion fruits and mast if they're hungry enough. Uh, the next animal is gray wolf. And gray wolves actually did occur in Maryland. They were probably extirpated from Maryland in the late 1700s. Um, I don't know if any of you have all been to St. Mary's City before, but if you're ever down there, there's a exhibit down there in the Native American area where they, where they have the visitor center. And I, the last time I was down there, there was a gray wolf skin that was in with some of the other mammal skins. And I looked at the back of it, and it was dated 1609. So gray wolves did occur in the state, and, um, and that skin is down there at St. Mary's um, that documents that they did exist here. Um, why were they extirpated? Extreme human persecution. People are afraid of wolves. And so they have to, they just feel like they have to kill them. Also predator control, loss of habitat, cutting down all the forests doesn't help any for them. The nearest population of wolves to Maryland, Southern Ontario and the Great Lakes states would be the closest places where you could see them. Prefer, again, they like a mix of coniferous deciduous forest, just like the Martin with scattered open areas. But their habitat is really driven by their prey availability. So wherever the prey live, that's where they're going to live. Okay, so their prey is generally large ungulates. So they like deer, they like elk, they like bison. They'll eat livestock. They, they like rabbits and hares, beaver, small mammals, and also they'll eat carrion, which is the dead animals. Um, pack size for wolves. Generally, you have an alpha male, an alpha female, and the offspring are part of the pack. And so average pack size for wolves is generally six to 10, but pack size can get up to 30. So that, that's the largest pack size I could find in the literature was 30. And here is a, an early document from 1658 from St. Leonard's, Maryland, basically a decree for killing of wolves. Notice how they spell the wolf, W-O-O-L-F-E-S. So this is basically rewarding, rewarding 100 pounds of tobacco from the county to every wolf that shall be killed. So I thought that was very, very interesting. That's, that's how much hatred the people, people had for wolves. Okay, uh, red wolf is also extirpated from Maryland. It inhabited most of the state. It probably was extirpated from Maryland in the late 1700s, just like gray wolves. Why was it extirpated? Again, extreme human persecution, predator control, loss of habitat. Um, and I put later genetic swamping, and that's, that's more um, modern day problem where the red wolves um, basically are getting swamping out. They're swamped out genetically by breeding with coyotes. They interbreed with coyotes. The closest population of red wolves is in Dare County, North Carolina, which is coastal North Carolina. Uh, their preferred habitat, swamps, coastal prairies, forest. They prey on small mammals. So their prey items are generally smaller than gray wolves. So they'll, they'll prey on small mammals, rabbits, hares, birds, bird eggs, carrion, berries, and mast like acorns. Um, they were recognized in 2019 by the National Academy of Science as a full species. So the question of whether they're a full species or a hybrid has been up in the air for a long time, but the National Academy did a big study last year and determined that they are a full species. And unfortunately, there's only nine individuals remaining in the wild. Only nine, they're down to nine right now. All of them are in North Carolina in Dare County. And they are listed as critically endangered by the IUCN, and they're endangered and protected under the Endangered Species Act of the US. So they're in really bad shape right now. And then the last one I have here is the snowshoe hare. So what I would focus your attention on, look at the size of those back feet. 
Those are pretty serious back feet right there. So the last records of snowshoe hare are from Garrett County in the mid 1900s. Um, DNR declared it extirpated in 1986. It's still found in high elevation areas of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. It has extra large back feet with really long fur, and those act like snowshoes to allow them to move easily through areas where there's snow. Okay, um, they prefer a mixed spruce fir forest with lots of shrub layer underneath for forage close to water source somewhere. So some kind of a bog or a stream or a wet meadows, what they prefer. Why were they extirpated? Loss of habitat, lots of logging, human encroachment, competition from increased white-tailed deer populations. Okay, so that was probably the thing that really um, put them over the edge to get rid of them is white-tailed deer um, started becoming extra abundant because we got rid of the big predators and so they started eating all the understory and there was a lot less to eat for the black tail or for the uh, snowshoe hare. Also climate change as well is gonna be another reason. And again, that's because of uh, things warming up and you're getting less snow um, in their preferred habitat. So I put this slide in here to remind us that there are some really cool mammals that used to occur in Maryland that don't occur there anymore. So they're extirpated, but these guys were extirpated well before European colonization. So Maryland used to have saber-toothed tigers. They used to have cave bears. They used to have giant ground sloths. They used to have wolverines. There was a, there was a different species of wolverine from the current one that used to live in Maryland. I mean, think about how cool is that? We used to have badgers, cheetahs, lions, mastodons, tapers, four different species of peccaries. We had pikas, we had lemmings, elk, shrub ox. All of these things were, um, were species and bones that were found from the Cumberland Bone Cave, which is a, a very famous um, fossilized uh, site. And by the way, it was, it was um, largely explored by the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, which is the property that I am on right now. Um, they're, they're the administrators of the property, the Powder Mill Biological Reserve, which is where I am uh, broadcasting from right now. So what about introductions, reintroductions? So I have five species here that I chose. Um, and, and some of these you would probably expect that you'd be able to see um, or that, that you would think I would put on this list. So Sika deer, that's an obvious one. Nutria, um, horses. Uh, Fisher might not be an obvious one, and black-tailed jackrabbit, you're probably wondering, you know, why is that on there? Um, so, well, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, Sika deer, if you've ever been to Assateague, you've seen Sika deer. Um, they're very beautiful deer. The, both the young and the adults have spots, white spots on them. Um, Sika deer are more closely related to elk than they are white-tailed deer. They're actually in the same genus as elk. So they're, they're very closely related. They have a lot of the same behaviors. They have some of the same kind of vocalizations. Um, they bugle like the elk do. Um, they were introduced from Japan in, uh, in Assateague. It was the 1920s where they, were, where they arrived. They were brought in for hunting purposes. Um, they inhabit all the lower Eastern shore counties. Their highest densities are found in South Dorchester County. So that's around um, Blackwater, National Wildlife Refuge. Um, they live in suboptimal habitat for white-tailed deer. Okay, so the habitat that they live in, white-tailed deer don't like it that much. Okay, so the competition between Sika and whitetail is limited because of that. Uh, Maryland DNR manages Sika deer with hunting seasons. Um, the pelage of Sika deer is reddish brown in the summer and it's dark brown to black in the winter. And as I mentioned, the young and adults both have white spots. Um, the food preference is ag fields. So they'll go out and feed in ag fields. Um, they'll eat mast, which is acorns and things like that. They eat poison ivy. They like greenbrier and marsh grasses. Um, the feral horses is next. And if you've been to Assateague, you've probably seen these too. Um, these were introduced on coastal islands in Maryland, Virginia, all the way down to Cumberland Island, Georgia. 
by early European settlers in the 1600s. Um, it was some people um, estimate or some people think that they were uh, as a result of uh, shipwrecks on the island. But I think the most of the evidence points to people put them on those islands for a reason, because if they were if they weren't on the mainland, they didn't have to pay taxes on them. And there was no fencing rules on the islands, but they had fencing rules on the mainland. So they were able to just let them go on the island and they didn't have to pay taxes on them. So they occur on Astatique Island, which is about an 800 acre island. The herds occur in groups of two to 12 animals. They've been controlled, their population size has been controlled by a contraceptive vaccine that they received since 1994. Um, the latest estimate of numbers I've seen is 90 horses at present. So they keep a close tab on those because they do um, damage some of the habitat on the island. Um, Assateague Island, as you, as, if you've been there, you know this already. It's wide open, it's sandy, it's windy. It's a harsh environment. And so it provides poor food quality for horses. Okay, so the horses are not getting the, the food quality that they might like. Um, the horses use the beach a lot because there's lots of biting flies and mosquitoes and other bugs down there that uh, bother them. And so they use the beach a lot because they can get more uh, breezes and wind that keep them off of them. Um, these horses are genetically horses. Okay, so that means that their, their phenotype, the way that they look, their appearance is that of a horse, okay? Um, but the body size is reduced. So it's smaller than a regular horse, but it's, it's not reduced because of genetic considerations. It's reduced because of the environment. So the environment that they're in is basically making them adapted to a harsh environment, okay? So they're genetically horses, but their body size is reduced because of the environmental conditions in which they live. Um, and their food is generally various grasses and browse uh, twigs and things like that that they find on the island. The nutria is next. And the nutria is a really large rodent, semi-aquatic rodent that's native to South America, particularly Southern South America. Um, it's originally brought to the US from South America in 1889, specifically for the fur trade. So in other words, they wanted to raise them to be able to harvest the fur. So they were imported from Argentina in 1939 in Maryland and introduced to Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. Their present distribution is pretty much most of the Eastern shore. So Caroline, Talbot, Dorchester, Wacomico, Worcester, and Somerset counties. So that's where we find them now. Uh, but unfortunately, the fur trade fizzled on them, nutria escaped, and some of them got released from pens and wild published populations got established as a result. Um, nutria feed on native plants that hold wetland soil together. And so they're destructing or they're, they're destructive to the marsh vegetation and that intensifies loss of coastal marshes. And then and you add uh, sea level rise and, and climate change, that even makes it worse. Okay, so these guys are heavily controlled as pests. So the USDA Wildlife Services um, goes out and basically kills them um, whenever they get a chance. So they're, they're not being um, promoted as uh, to increase their populations, they're being promoted to decrease their populations because they are damaging the um, aquatic vegetation. So here is a poster, a wanted poster of nutria. Okay, so you can see that if you see a nutria, you're supposed to call this number to report sightings. Okay, so the Chesapeake Bay Nutria Eradication Program. So you can see the Fish and Wildlife Service is involved, USDA Wildlife Services is involved, the state of Maryland's involved. Okay, so they're, they're looking for these guys and they wanna take them out. Okay, so, um, so the ones that we see in Maryland were from Argentina. Okay, the fisher is next, and the fisher is a little bit of a different um, case in the, in the sense that we didn't directly introduce it to the state. 
Okay, so the fish is related to the martin. It is a weasel. It's a, a family Mustelidae. It's a weasel. It's larger than the martin. And it comes from, the name comes from the English fitch. And so that is a slang word meaning polecat. And that's old world, so that's European. So in Europe, you have, in Europe and Asia, you have um, mustelids or weasels called polecats. And so this one looked like a polecat. So that's where the, that's where the name Fisher came from. Um, so that the animal doesn't actually fish. It is extirpated from Maryland um, hundreds of years ago, uh, probably around the same time as the Martin, but it's reintroduced indirectly from West Virginia. Okay, so West Virginia had a reintroduction project in 1969. They introduced fishers from New Hampshire into Tucker and Pocahontas counties in West Virginia. And within a few years, they made their way to Maryland. So their present distribution right now is the four Western counties, Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, and Frederick. And I noticed, uh, I found a, um, a report that some possible sightings of fishers were found in Carroll County as well. And I don't know if they were confirmed or not, but it's certainly possible that they are in Carroll County also. Um, they prefer large tracts of coniferous or mixed hardwood forests with large trees for denning and dense overstory above. So that means they want nice um, uh, tree leaf cover over them. Um, so that's similar to what the martins require. Um, prey, they generally eat small mammals, particularly squirrels, uh, birds and bird eggs, carrion, fruit, beech nuts, frogs, and the last one on here, porcupines. And they are well known for their adaptation in preying on porcupines. So porcupines are very tough to be able to kill. Okay, so these guys have developed a hunting technique, which is pretty gross. And I don't know if I want to go into details on it. Um, you know, maybe we could do that offline if you want to know for sure. Um, it's pretty gruesome. Okay, suffice it to say that they focus on areas, the, the one or two areas of the porcupine where there's no quills. Okay, and so they have been able to figure out how to do that. So they can efficiently kill a porcupine, whereas almost every other predator cannot do that. Okay, but the fishers have figured out how to do it. Okay, we have fishers here at my, where I'm at, a cabin right now, we have fishers here and we have them on our trail cameras. Okay, um, and then finally, black-tailed jackrabbits. So how did this get in here? Okay, so you can see that this, this is a big bunny. These are a lot bigger than rabbits that you're used to seeing here in this area. Okay, they've got very large ears because they're from arid areas. And so they can dissipate heat with their ears because they have large surface area in their ears with lots of, lots of blood vessels. So they can cool off if they need giant ears. So they were introduced into Maryland from the Western US in the mid 1970s. And many releases occurred um, and they were conducted by sportsmen, not by Maryland DNR. Okay, so DNR didn't sanction any of these things. They were thought to have been released at Remington Farms in Kent County. Um, Remington Farms, of course, is the past name. Um, that's not the current name of the place, but that's the place that DuPont owned, and that's in Kent County. Um, three specimens of black-tailed jackrabbits are housed at the Frostburg Vertebrate Museum, so they have specimens of these guys from Kent County. Um, releases also occurred in the eastern shore of Virginia around the same time, so around the mid-70s. So various sportsmen's group were trying to establish black-tailed jackrabbits on the eastern shore in the mid-1970s. And so they, they were basically, they didn't take and they killed all of them. They didn't reproduce. And so they basically disappeared within a short period of time. So probably within 10 years, they were gone. So, so let me summarize here by a quick overview summary. So the mammalian fauna of Maryland is dynamic. So what I mean by that is it continues to change over time. So we continue to lose species and we continue to lose populations. So examples, Eastern harvest mouse, spotted skunk, Allegheny wood rat, um, uh, North American, I'm sorry, North Atlantic right whale, 
These are these are Maryland species that are on the verge of disappearing. Um, and these these um, these kinds of things, losing these species and populations of them, not only make declining mammals scarce, it also and, and requiring regulatory protection, like the Endangered Species Act, it also makes formerly common mammals less common. And that's something a lot of people lose sight of. So we're all we're always concerned about threatened mammal, threatened and endangered mammals and making them scarce, but we're, but the common mammals are becoming less common. Okay, and that's a real concern. Um, at the same time, we're gaining new species like the Seminole bat and the Mexican freetail bat due to climate change. They're moving from the south, moving up to the north, and they're crossing the Maryland border into Maryland. These are species that that are certainly not listed in Paradiso's book, and they've only they've only been found in Maryland over the last couple of years. Rewilding is a really big movement in conservation biology right now, and that basically means that people want to take species that have been extirpated and reintroduce them into areas. Okay, but um, I think, anyways, that this is going to be unlikely for the foreseeable future because of budgetary constraints and also various human attitudes towards that. Um, you have to get the buy in from the local people if you're going to reintroduce something. And if they don't like it, then it's probably not going to happen. Okay, so and not only that, it costs a lot of money to do this. So if you've got budgetary constraints like we all have right now, all the states do, then they're not going to be able to pay for this stuff. Um, Non-native species like nutria, brown and Norway rats, house mice, feral pigs, feral cats, they all continue to cause ecological damage as well as economic damage in Maryland. And um, some of them, like feral pigs, um, there's a lot of stories about how they're increasing across the whole country, and they're becoming a huge problem. So many mammal species which can adapt to humans are increasing their range and numbers in Maryland. So coyotes, black bears, raccoons. Um, coyotes, in the, in the Paradiso 1969 book, there are only two records of coyotes in the entire state in 1969. Now we have them in every one of the 23 counties. So there are coyotes in every single county in the state. In 1969, there were only two records. So that's how much they've expanded their range because they can adapt to humans. Same with black bears, same with raccoons, same with others. Many mammals in Maryland are relatively unstudied. We just haven't paid any attention to them. Pygmy and water shrews are examples. Uh, the weasels are examples. All three species of weasels occur in Maryland. Uh, some bats, some rodents, some marine mammals. We don't know hardly anything about them. And so their statuses in Maryland remain either uncertain or unknown. So um, mammals require habitat, food, water. And as we continue to expand uh, urban, suburban areas, we build more housing complexes, we build more industrial parks, commercial buildings, parking lots, golf courses, we widen roads. These things are gonna to start to disappear. The things that mammals require will start to disappear and the mammals will follow soon after. Um, these mammals all had or have important ecological functions. They serve as sentinels for us, for humans. So we need to heed their message, pay attention to things, and by all means, listen to the ecologists, field biologists, and other scientists. After all, even on Gilligan's Island, they listen to the professor, not the millionaire. Thank you. The end. Thank you, Steve. That was great. I hope I hope that was uh, met your expectations. I think that not only met, but exceeded our expectations. As, as I look around, everybody looks smarter than they did when they than when you started. So I think you did a good job with that. Um, you can go ahead and stop sharing if you want, and we can open it up for questions. I'm sure that okay. people have some questions. There we go. Any questions? Yeah, I'd be happy to take questions. Why? I have a question, Steve. You said that that 
they were reintroducing the elk all around the area, but the people in Maryland didn't want elk. Was there a reason? Want. Was were, was there a reason why people are anti elk in Maryland? You know, I I saw that and I. I made a note to myself that I need to look up where that was. I don't know the exact location. All I know is that that they were offered, the state of Maryland, DNR, offered to reintroduce them into some location in Maryland, and the local people said no. They didn't want it. So I don't know the location. I, I will find out, though. Robin was interested to see, are there more beavers now? Are the beaver populations growing or decreasing, do you know? I think the beaver populations have been increasing because I've seen anyways that more people are letting them do their thing. So there was a, there was a movement for a while that basically um, <clears throat> wanted to stop their, their activities. A lot of people don't like their activities. I mean, they're, they're nature's natural engineer and some people don't like the engineering too much. But I've seen, I've seen more movements um, around that basically say, all right, well, we'll let them do their thing. Okay, so so I think if they're allowed to do their thing, then they're going to increase in population. <clears throat> and the, uh, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the nutria from being from Louisiana myself. Yeah. And yeah. uh, I know that one of the ways that they were trying to control, and there's it's always open season for nutria was they were trying to get the local chefs to come up with good recipes for Nutria to make it the a next big thing that people would always want to go out and buy some Nutria meat. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think they, I don't think they succeeded too well on that. No, you can get some Nutria sausage and Nutria meatballs, but I mean, people really aren't going to go after, pay a lot of money for some rodents. Uh, Louis Lewis Bernstein is interested in, I thought that Western Maryland and Pennsylvania had been forest. So where were the prairies for the bison? Okay, that's, I saw that question and that's a good question. Um, they, those, those Western counties were not all forested. So there were natural grasslands there that were maintained as grasslands. And so they were, they were selecting those open grassland areas and not the forest. So it, so those counties are not all forested. Have uh, they changed? Are they more forested now? Or are there uh, any grasslands in those areas? Or You know, that's a good question also. So there's been some efforts in the state to try to maintain grasslands because if, if you just, if you, the way, the way things are, I mean, they can, they can, you can have trees, small trees and stuff crop up in there. And before you know it, the grassland's gone. Right. So it does take burning. It takes some burning and some, some human intervention to try to maintain some of these grasslands. So yes. So there probably was regular Native American burning of these grasslands. Has, That's what I think. Are the porcupines, have they, are they still in Maryland or are they? No, so the por porcupines occur in the four Western counties. So they occur in Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, and Frederick. So those are the only counties in Maryland they occur in. And they're not super common, but they do occur there in those four counties. And um, Patty is interested in coyotes and wolves and their genetics. And can they breed with dogs? That's a really good question. I didn't feel like I had time to go into that. I was going to talk about it and I bypassed it. So here's the situation you have. So you have the family Canidae, which is the Canids, the dog family. Okay. And so you have gray wolf, you have red wolf, you have domestic dogs, and you have, um, what was the other one I'm thinking of? Um, coyote. You have coyote. So those are all in the same family. Okay, so some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. Basically, they all interbreed with each other. Okay, so domestic dogs were domesticated from wolves. Okay, so they, they, have, um, they have wolf genes, uh, at least some remnant of them. Um, and so they all interbreed with each other. And so the problem is um, trying to figure out, you know, if you have a particular candidate, you're trying to figure out, is it a coyote or is it a wolf? or is it a dog? 
you have to look at the genetics and find out, you know, you know, the, the, the animal might have like, you know, 20% gray wolf DNA and, and 80% domestic dog or, or 10% coyote, something like that. So there's, because they all interbreed with each other, you get this big hybrid swarm of canids. And that really confuses the, um, the taxonomy, what you call what. And so you have to take physical measurements of the animal and you have to look at the genetics. And, um, and there's no agreement with the canid biologists. They can't agree on what's what. And so I think the thing that's the most important there is that um, when you declare a red wolf, for example, ex, um, ex, if you declare that endangered, that has regulatory power to it. So you're calling it a full species and it's regulated under the Endangered Species Act. And so the Endangered Species Act is treating it as a full species, even though it might be a hybrid. So, the, so by law, it's being treated as a full species. So, so you have the regulatory aspect of it and then you have the biological taxonomic ex, uh, aspect of it. So like I said, the people that are doing the research on this stuff, they don't agree on it. You know, we have up at, up at this um, cabin, this area right here, right behind the cabin, we have a population of koi wolves. And we've got them on camera, okay? These guys are bigger than coyotes. They're not wolves, but they have wolf genes, okay? And so, they're, and, and so coyotes in this area are solitary. These guys hunt in groups cooperatively. So they cooperatively hunt together in a group. I have four of them on cameras at least three different times together. So they're, they're able to take a deer, whereas a solitary coyote could not take a deer. But the koi wolves, four of them together, could easily take an adult deer. So if we get expansion of koi wolves, we have a possibility of being able to control white-tailed deer better which is, I mean, that would be an upside of having koi wolves. If there was one, that would be one. Any other questions for Steve? You have them, you better use them right now. Yeah, ask me. Pick his brain. What is your favorite um, mammal? in Maryland? Oh boy. Um, current or, or extirpated? Well, give me a current, a extirpated and a current. Uh, my favorite one that's extirpated is the one that was on the last slide, the bison. Mm -hmm. I, just think, I just think bison are so cool. I, I lived in, uh, went to school in Oklahoma for a while and I just, uh, I got to see wild bison herds there at Wichita Mountains National Wildlife Refuge all the time. And I think they're just amazing. Um, current ones, boy, um, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I like uh, I like uh, silverhead bats. I think silverhead bats are really cool. I like weasels. I like all the mustelids. So I like the weasels. I think they're very cool. Um, so those would probably be some of my favorites. Well, Sarah agrees with you. She wanted, well, she wants to know a little bit more about the weasel species in Maryland. She so, all right. So, so the short tail weasel is also known as the ermine and they barely get into Maryland. So they're found in Pennsylvania, but they, they do dip into Maryland just a little bit. Um, long tail weasel occurs throughout the state and least weasel occurs to my knowledge, just in the western couple of counties. Only a couple records of any of them in the state. All right, so they are so unknown in the state. Nobody's studying them. Nobody traps them. Uh, when I say nobody, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's a relative term. Um, there's no mammal biologists that I know of that are studying them. Okay, so trappers might trap one occasionally. Uh, but then we never hear about it because they don't publish about it because they're not, they're not scientists, they're just recreational trappers. Okay, so a lot of times those records never get reported and we don't know about it. Um, but weasels are by and large 
not known much of in the state. Uh, but so, but all three species do occur. So the widely, the most widely ranging one in the state is long tail weasel. So you think that it's a, if if you find a, a minkish roadkill, it could probably it's most probably the long tailed mink then in Maryland. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the long tail weasel. So the mink would be like the next size up from the long tail weasel, and the weasels go um, large, medium, small. So long tail is the largest one, small or short tail is the next one, and least is the smallest one. And to make it more complicated, weasels have sexual dimorphism, which means that the male and female are the different size. And so you have the female long tail would be about the same size as the male short tail. And so they overlap. And so uh, the, the dimorphism is strong enough where the Male and female long tail weasel would actually hunt different prey. Mm. So a large, a large male long tail weasel could take a rabbit. And it's and the rabbit's way bigger than the long tail weasel, but they could take a rabbit because they're very powerful hunters. A uh, female long tail would have to probably rely on, on rodents. Smaller, smaller rodents. And Robin wants to bring back pikas. Oh, pikas. Pikas, pikas occur on the Sky Islands in, in the Western US. So the Sky Islands are like the high peaks. And with climate change, as things warm up, those peaks are getting smaller. And the problem with them is, is that there's no connectivity or there's limited connectivity between the Sky Islands. And so if you're pushing them closer and closer to the top peak of each of those, you're basically decreasing their populations and you're making it harder for them to, to intermix with other pika populations. So they're stuck on islands, basically. And mm -hmm. so they're only at the highest elevations and with climate change, it's making those islands smaller. And so they're, they're really in a lot of trouble, unfortunately. Why are why have uh, there been such limited studies of mammals in Maryland? Do you think? Uh, that's a good question. So I think I think a lot of the studies have been done at Frostburg. Um, there were several mammalogists. There's still one there right now. Um, and there, my major advisor when I for my I did my master's at the Appalachian Environmental Lab in Frostburg, and. Um, He's, no, he's not there anymore. He moved, but he was a mammologist, and uh, he did a lot of work on sika deer at, on Assateague Island, and um, there's not a lot of mammologists in the state, so Frostburg has had a couple of them, and Towson has one or two, um, but most of the other universities don't have, uh, well, Salisbury has one also, uh, but most of the other universities don't have them, and so... Um, there's just uh, not a lot of mammalogists in the state. And, so and there, there's, there's mammalogists at the Smithsonian, um, but their staff is greatly reduced right now. And a lot of those guys, they don't actually do the work in Maryland. They're going off and doing it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. so, so that's probably why. So if you know any, well, then that's a good opportunity for young scientists to get involved with, mem with mammalogy and in Maryland since there's exactly. a lot to study and learn. Good opportunities right there. Yep. Um, we want, we have a question. Is there interstate cooperation between the adjacent states, I guess, in terms of wildlife management? Uh, yes, yes, there definitely is. Um, so I'll just give you an example. So West Virginia got the fishers. They got them from New Hampshire in return West Virginia gave New Hampshire wild turkeys. And so New Hampshire was able to reintroduce wild turkeys up there, which got extirpated. So, so states have cooperative agreements where one helps one out, then the other one reciprocates. So that's common. So they do that. So Maryland DNR probably has some agreements with some of the other states on various species, various wildlife efforts, but um, 
I'm not aware that they're doing much reintroduction right now. And, and with the state budgets the way they're gonna be for the next several years, I don't see them doing anything for a while. Um, but yes, there is cooperation there. Um, it, it just depends on having a mutual interest. So if you find states that have mutual interests, I'm sure Maryland and Virginia, and Maryland and West Virginia, Maryland and Delaware, Maryland and Pennsylvania, would have some mutual interests that they could cooperate on. I'm sure they would if the situation was right and they had the money to do it. All right. Any more questions for Steve? Well, this has been great, Steve. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. And we're all jealous that you're up in the mountains in a cabin. <laughs> and I'm going to have a nice fire in the fireplace tonight. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Yep. Uh, we'll have to invite you back uh, later on to give us another talk. Yeah, I just saw a question on what keeps the elk out of Maryland. So they basically would require a reintroduction. So what keeps them out is that the closest elk herds are more than 100 miles away. So they're not, they're going to have, they would, in order to get to Maryland, they would have to cross busy intersections like Route 70 and Route 68 and, you know, and those kind of, 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 of super highways. And so they're probably not going to do that. And so because the closest elk population is north central Pennsylvania, they're not going to make it down here by, the, by themselves. They would require a reintroduction effort by Maryland DNR. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And, and thank you, Steve, for sharing your, your vast knowledge with us. Tomorrow, we have an extra special program. If you are looking for something to do, it is our archaeology club. We'll be sharing their um, information about the excavations at Lock Raven Reservoir at the, and seeing what, what's, what's going on there. So if you want to come back, register for that, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Otherwise, we have some other things uh, coming up. and support us through buying a raffle ticket and everybody uh stay safe and i hope to see y'all very soon to learn some more thank you thank you everybody <laughs>